Uh, welcome and thank you all for joining this webinar. I am Suresh Subramani, the Global Director of the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society, also called TIGS or TIGS. We are delighted that you've joined us here for the second lecture in a new series that we started called Science Serving Society. And this is obviously sponsored by TIGS. So the goals of these lectures are really threefold. First, we wish to highlight national and, and indeed global problems in healthcare and food security. Second, we intend to focus our attention on current progress, namely what has been done, how well is it working, and what are the challenges. But most importantly, finally, we're here to offer solutions through discussions with a panel of experts. Uh, our topic for today is something that the entire world uh, is worrying about on a daily basis, more specifically to focus on COVID-19 in India, the challenges, logistics, and cures. Just by way of background, I want to take you back to 2007, where scientists studying a class of viruses called coronaviruses issued the following dire warning in a publication. And I will quote here from what they said. They said, the presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV-like viruses in horseshoe bats is a time bomb. The possibility of re-emergence of SARS and other novel viruses should not be ignored. And here we are in 2020, uh, as you know, on uh, uh, December 31st, 2019, news about this time bomb was announced rather innocu innocuously by the Wuhan Municipal Health Commission in China, where they reported a cluster of 27 cases of pneumonia in Wuhan in the Hubei province of China. On the very next day, the WHO, on January 1st, 2020, the WHO, which had been waiting for and preparing for such pandemics on a global basis, activated what's called an incident managed support team at WHO. And within about another 11 days or so, on January 12th, China publicly shared information on the sequence of this uh, novel coronavirus that's now called SARS-CoV-2. CoV stands for coronavirus. And within a few weeks, this virus gained infamy by being identified as the cause of what has now become one of the deadliest pandemics in, in modern history, namely COVID-19. Uh, as of today, the world has seen almost 25 million cases and 850,000 deaths. And India being number three in the world with respect to the total number of cases. While we are fortunate that in India, there are fewer deaths per million people than in most other countries, it is important to note today that India is now the fastest growing coronavirus caseload uh, compared to any other country in the world with at least 75,000 new infections ha happening on a daily basis. Right. So to, to, this is the background for what we're going to talk about today. So to highlight the problem, the progress and new solutions regarding today's topic, we've assembled a very exciting panel each of whom would present their perspectives initially for about 10 to 12 minutes. And at the end of the presentation, I will engage the speakers in a panel discussion on a set of wide ranging topics. And meanwhile, we encourage you, the audience, to send in questions to the panelists via the chat function. And we will find a way to answer the most important of these questions offline. But we thank you for your indulgence and patience on, on this particular point. So the outstanding credentials of the experts are in the program announcement itself. So I'm going to keep my introductions brief so as to allow you enough time to tap into their wisdom. So we're going to start the program today with Dr. Gagandeep Kang, who is a currently a professor of microbiology at the Christian Medical College at Bellore, where she trained in medicine and microbiology. Until recently, in fact, just uh, the, earlier this month, she was on sabbatical as the executive director for the Translational Health Science Technology Institute in New Delhi, which is an autonomous institute of the Department of Biotechnology. She is a world expert on enteric infections in children, including hospital and community-based surveillance, as well as in clinical trials of new and existing vaccines. And we're very proud that she is the first Indian woman to be elected as a fellow of the Royal Society. So Dr. Kang will talk about the epidemiology of COVID-19 in India and challenges in moving towards a cure. So Gagandeep, I'll hand this over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Suresh. So I thought a nice way to look at how uh, 
SARS-CoV-2 has been spreading and growing in the country was to count the number of cases on a log scale. So we had our first case on the 30th of January. It took us until March 15th to reach the 100th case, March 29th for the 1000th, April 14th for the 10,000th. And now we are at about 3.6 million cases. And these have come from approximately 40 million tests that have been done. Now, if we look at daily confirmed cases, as Suresh pointed out, we are somewhere above 70,000 for quite a few days now. And we had the dubious distinction of having the maximum number of cases reported in the world a couple of days ago. If we look at trajectories of what is happening, on the next graph, what I have here is daily new confirmed cases per million people. And if you look at what's happening in the US, which has had significantly more cases than in India so far, or look at the trajectory in the UK, you can see that in other places, the curve has really flattened, whereas in India, we are continuing to grow go upwards. Now, if we think about it, this is absolutely not unexpected. We have 1.3 billion people, and that means we have a lot of people who are available for the virus to infect. Now, if you look at the what's happening around the world and the number of tests that are being done, if you see colors that are in orange or red, that means the percentage positivity of tests continues to be very high. And that means that you're, we are not testing enough. If the colors are in blue, then that is places where test positivity rates are relatively low, which means that these are the countries that are testing adequately. And as you can see here, despite the 41 million tests that have been done in India, we are still close to an almost 10% positivity rate, which means that we are not testing enough for our population. Now, if you look at testing over time, what's really happened? Well, when we started, we had only one laboratory, the National Institute of Virology that was testing. And subsequently, when testing was uh, extended to other government laboratories, the National Institute of Virology had to confirm all tests that had been done elsewhere. This continued pretty much through January and February. And in March, about 50 government labs were testing by the first week of March. A hundred government labs moving for the first time beyond ICMR defined labs by the third week of March. And then private labs were allowed to test by the fourth week of March. And this was in the lockdown. And at this stage, it became extremely difficult to get reagents and kits because of the lockdown. So it started with 12 labs initially. And by the end of June, we had about a thousand laboratories testing. And now we have about 1500 labs testing, of which about a thousand are in the government sector and the remainder are private laboratories. When testing first started off, it was RT-PCR. And then somewhere around April, there was huge excitement about the idea of rapid tests. And the first tests that came were antibody tests and weren't particularly good. So at that stage, people were discouraged from using those tests, except in the context of containment zones. And even there, I'm not quite sure how the interpretation of that testing was arranged. 
More recently, we have had the availability of antigen tests, and we are now in a situation where it's a little bit peculiar because we have a total number of tests reported and we do not understand in all locations what percentage of the tests that are detecting virus are PCR or antigen tests. In Delhi, it's all two thirds to three quarters almost of antigen tests over RT-PCR, but in the rest of the country, we don't necessarily know. We've also had a range of antibody tests made available, and these have been used in zero surveys, which we will cover quickly. If we look at the zero surveys in India, the first survey was the one at the bottom of the table, which it was an all India survey conducted by ICMR in May. Approximately 24,000 samples tested and the positivity rate was 0.7%. Subsequently, a couple of months later, May was when the lockdown was just being lifted and, the, and this was really done uh, at the beginning of May. So that's not surprising, but all the surveys that have been done subsequent to that are showing very, very high rates. In Indore, even though the positivity rate is 7.8% overall, it is about 30% in areas that are densely populated. So that's not different from what we are seeing in other parts of the country. And it's important to understand that these rates are rates that have not been seen in any other part of the world. In places that were really badly hit, like New York, the highest that they got to was about 30% in some parts of New York and a lot lower elsewhere. In London, it was 10%. In Sweden, about 7%. So really, these kinds of rates are unprecedented and we need to analyze these data carefully to understand what this means in terms of population density and for the future of testing in these areas. Now, what do these zero surveys mean for Indian vaccines? We currently have three vaccines in clinical trials. That's Covaxin and inactivated vi vaccines, Zycov D, which is plasmid DNA, and Covishield, which is the Chadox vaccine. And it's interesting to note that up to 60% of volunteers who have come forward for these vaccine trials have needed to be excluded because they had pre-existing antibodies. Obviously, this was not in every location, but in some locations, we are finding very, very high rates of seropositivity which has meant that per protocol, these individuals could not be included in the trials. Now, these are the first three vaccines that are in trials. We have multiple other vaccines in development. And if seropositivity continues to go up, this is going to be a significant challenge for people seeking to do trials because it will affect recruitment rates. Now, if we look at drugs and vaccines, I've covered the vaccines component at a very, very high level. But if we look at ongoing clinical studies, there are 187 studies that are registered in the clinical trials registry in India. Most of them are really, really, really tiny single institution trials. And this is a problem. While we must test traditional medicines, we must look at repurposed drugs or at new biological therapies, it's very important to understand that if we want to robustly test any of these interventions, we can't do that in small trials. We need multi-site studies and we need for them to be well done. So to counter the many small trials, there's also India's participation in the WHO Solidarity Study, where hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir ritonavir were dropped a few weeks ago, 
but interferon and remdesivir are being continued. There is a new drug, which is a BTK inhibitor that is going to be added shortly to the study. Now, if we look at drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics, the regulators play an important role in making sure that the people who need them get them fast. And the CDSCO has a fast track mechanism for review. Diagnostics currently need to be validated by ICMR approved laboratories if they are made in India. If they have a CE mark or are FDA approved, even under an EUA, they can be imported into India and used. For drugs and for vaccines, there is a fast track mechanism. And for vaccines, there have been um, studies that have been approved for phase one, two, or two, three trials, which usually does not happen in India. Usually these are sequential studies. So the seamless design is something that has been done specially for SARS-CoV-2. Also new for India is that manufacturing at risk has been permitted for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And this is what has resulted in serum and other vaccine manufacturers being able to make doses for vaccines that have not yet been evaluated in clinical efficacy. There are discussions with FDA, EMA, MHRA, and WHO on regulatory pathways. And we expect to see from CDSCO guidance for vaccine development soon. In addition to that, just to end, ICMR had a very interesting meeting a couple of weeks ago that actually discussed the idea of doing controlled human infection models with multiple experts from different parts of the world saying, on one hand, this was a good thing, and on the other, that this was a an unknown for a new virus, and we really needed to be very careful. So there are on the regulatory front for clinical trials, a lot more that needs to be done, and we will need to see how the regulators and the science funding agencies handle all that. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gagandi, for a very honest uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know factual uh, presentation. So I want to transition from uh, the Indian context to the global context. Uh, and as many of you know, Dr. Samia Swaminathan is going to present a global perspective directly from the World Health Organization or WHO, where she's the chief scientist and she's located in Geneva, Switzerland. She's trying to juggle multiple meetings and we're very, very thankful, Samia, for your presence here. So she was a, previously the Deputy Director General for Programs at WHO. She's a pediatrician by training, but is a globally recognized researcher on tuberculosis and human immunodeficiency virus. So prior to her stint at WHO, Dr. Swaminathan was a Secretary of the Department of Health Research and Director General for the Indian Council for Medical Research. So she's going to talk to us about the global perspective uh, on COVID-19, on the COVID-19 pandemic, the lessons learned and the next steps. So Samia, thank you for joining us and I'm going to transition this over to you. Thank you, Suresh. So good evening to, to everyone. And um, in the next uh, eight to 10 minutes, I'll try to take you through uh, the last eight months uh, really, you know, looking from a global perspective at, at what's happened from the 31st of December when we first heard about this new, bi this new um, syndrome of atypical pneumonia to the 10th of January when the first um, sequence of the virus was shared. And by the uh, 11th of January, we had uh, six sequences from this new coronavirus that was deposited in a public database called GISAID. And currently there are 80,000 whole genome sequences in that database. And we can come back to why that's important. A large number from India as well, was slow to begin with, but uh, I think over a thousand uh, uh, sequences from, from India. And 
Of course, you read in the press all the time about the mutations that are happening and we need to expect that it's an RNA virus, it will mutate. Um, luckily, the rate of mutation uh, seems to be not as high as influenza virus, uh, for example. And scientists who have been tracking the mutations uh, and trying to correlate it with various properties of the virus, so far, at least the spike protein and the receptor binding domain has not had any significant mutations which would change the, the immunogenicity of that uh, protein. And therefore, so far, at least all the vaccines in development, at least the first round of uh, batch of vaccines are all against the spike protein, are all using that antigen. And therefore, it's important to track that. The other questions that come up is about certain strains having certain properties. There's one particular clade or uh, lineage, which is called the D614G, uh, where there's a mutation, obviously, at the 614 site, uh, which is now almost a predominant viral strain actually going around, and, uh, and uh, different countries are now picking it up. I think Indonesia was the latest. This uh, strain has been associated in the lab with uh, increased um, capacity to, to infect cells and replicate which means that it could translate into increased transmissibility, but um, whether it's a, that then goes with reduced virulence has been a postulate, and whether it's really translating into uh, increasing transmission between humans, we, we don't know. Now, there's obviously been a, a huge amount of uh, scientific uh, advance, a lot that we've learned in the last eight months. Um, and one of the key issues has been around uh, transmission and the modes of transmission. And there's been a lot of interest again, because obviously this impacts what your public health measures are going to be. Now, we knew right from the beginning that the human to human transmission would be occurring by droplet transmission. Uh, now the droplets that come out of a person's respiratory tract are of varying sizes and can come out during normal speaking as well as singing, shouting, laughing, coughing, etc. And um, of late, the debate has been around the aerosolization of particles and whether this is common and whether this actually is responsible for a lot of transmission. And while there is need for more research into this, good solid epidemiological research is needed um, because the questions come as to when somebody is most infectious. And, and now we know that people are probably most infectious a day or two before they develop symptoms, going up to two or three days after the development of symptoms. That's when you have the highest viral load uh, in, the, in the upper respiratory tract. The role of asymptomatic people is another issue. So, so when do people transmit? How do they transmit in terms of what we believe today is that it's more common to transmit through the large, larger droplets, which are directly being, you know, uh, transmitted from one person to the next, which means if you are in physical proximity for a significant period, you know, maybe 15 minutes or more, then that the droplets have a chance of falling directly onto your face, eyes, nose, etc., and And you getting infected. Um, there are other, uh, possibilities, aerosolization, for example, we know in hospital settings where you're doing procedures, then there's clearly enhanced risk of aerosolization. However, there's also has been shown that if you are in a closed environment with poor ventilation, with um, very little air exchange, uh, a lot of people sitting in the room sharing that space with somebody who's infected, then the, the the aerosols the, or the particles less than five microns can stay in the air for longer, uh, could be even a, an hour or two or more. And then because of that, it could also be you know, taken by air currents and could reach people who are within, not within six meters, uh, six feet, but further away. Uh, and, and so there have been instances of uh, uh, these kind of events, uh, spreading events, or super spreader events in dormitories, in, in, um, in bars and pubs and churches and so on. 
um, in uh, meat packing factories, etc. So crowded places, closed environments and close contact, the three risk factors uh, for transmission. Which one plays more of an importance? Where depends on a number of factors. And as I said, it's also true that the viral load of the person who's in this place plays an important role. And it's estimated that less than 20% or maybe even less 10% of people are responsible for 80% of uh, transmission because for some reason they have a high viral load. And, and so these things are uh, important for, for thinking about interventions for prevention and now we know that you know starting with washing hands to maintaining physical distance and wearing a mask all reduce transmission through droplets paying attention to ventilation is important that's where outdoor is much safer than indoor and if you're indoor then you need to have good natural ventilation as far as possible if not the engineering controls need to be looked at in order to ensure that the air exchanges are high and that um, maybe filters um, need, to be, need to be put in place. Now, on the science, uh, one of the things that we realized very early on, and thanks to some of the work that had been done in the past at WHO, following Ebola outbreaks and so on, was the setting up of the Research and Development Blueprint Framework. Uh, this framework actually laid out what should happen for diseases like Ebola, like Nipah, like MERS. I mean, diseases which can cause serious epidemics and outbreaks, but which are, there's no market um, uh, interest and therefore there isn't an investment in diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. And so this framework over the last couple of years had really worked on developing a research roadmap for each of these viruses. There are 10 of them in that list. And the last one on that list was pathogen X, which, which meant that the scientists who developed this blueprint had anticipated that at some point there would be a new pathogen, a virus, most likely, most likely a zoonotic virus, most likely a respiratory virus that would cause an outbreak or a pandemic even. And so we put this into motion very quickly. Early in January, started convening scientists, researchers, physicians from all over the world, set up nine working groups to address different areas of, uh, of knowledge gaps and priorities, came out with a global research roadmap in February. These working groups continued to work for the last few months, you know, meeting either weekly or even more often. And in July, we then reconvened um, to take stock of what we've learned and to identify the remaining priorities. Now, one of these groups was focused on therapeutics, one was focused on vaccines, one on diagnostics, which are really the tools, but then you also had the others that were looking more at, at infection prevention and control, at transmission, at epidemiology, but also on things like uh, the ethics. Uh, there was a bioethics working group, as well as a social and behavioral sciences working group, which really turned out to be really very critical and important. Uh, and the bioethics working group has already uh, come out with several papers on different topics. Um, so just now on vaccines, this group started working on things like, okay, so what do you need in order to successfully develop a vaccine? And this is where we're talking about going from a normal time uh, of five to 10 years minimum to develop a vaccine and, and trying to compress that to 12 to 18 months. Um, so there was a group set up on enabling sciences, which started looking at assays and standardization of assays, started looking at animal models to identify which animal models would be best suited to study both drugs and, and vaccines. Um, a group that set up to, to develop a target product profile for, for COVID vaccines, another group that started developing a core protocol that we call the solidarity protocol for uh, vaccines and similarly we had one for therapeutics that um, Gagandeep just mentioned that India is part of. Um, and today we are in the position that um, we have, I think every day it seems to increase, but um, I think today's figure is something like 34 candidates in clinical development, nine of which are in phase three trials and a couple of them 
maybe even close to readouts in the next couple of months, we're certainly going to start seeing results from uh, a couple of uh, vaccines which have entered phase three trials. Now, what's very important really, and I think we'll discuss more after the next spe speaker is how do you assess the vaccine? What should be the regulatory framework? The, uh, every national regulatory authority obviously can make a decision on whether to issue an emergency use license or uh, uh, a regular license. Uh, WHO also has to take a call uh, on both on EUL, on pre-qualification pre of vaccines. Pre-qualification will need to be there for global procure procurement agencies like Gavi and uh, UNICEF. Now, in order to accelerate and do all of this in a, in a, in a coordinated manner, uh, we set up the ACT Accelerator, which is the Access to COVID Technologies Accelerator that brought together a number of agencies. And on the vaccines pillar, we have uh, CEPI, which is responsible for the R&D part with Gavi and WHO, with all com with the, obviously the three organizations with complementary uh, expertise and strength coming together. So on the one hand, we're accelerating R&D by investing in, uh, in, in certain candidates uh, and by also investing in manufacturing capacity. And on the other hand, you have the COVAX facility which is the procurement uh, body, which is pooling uh, procurement, both from self-financing countries, which will pay for vaccines, and also the uh, AMC, which is the mechanism to supply vaccines to 92 countries, which will not be paying for the vaccine. So these are the Gavi countries, which are about 78 plus, there are some IDA eligible small countries, islands, et cetera. So India is in that group of countries because that's LIC, LMICs, and the upper middle income and high income countries will purchase vaccines. And there's been a lot of discussion. There are options. Today, in fact, is the last date for, uh, for expressions of interest. We're delighted that the European Commission has just come on board. Germany has come on board. We had about 80 countries expressing interest in being part of COVAX. And these are the countries which will make upfront payments so that the facility has enough resources to then block, you know, advance, uh, make these advanced marketing pur purchasing commitments. So that's where we are today. The next few months are going to be extremely, uh, weeks rather, critical. On the one hand, we're also moving ahead with the solidarity vaccine trial. And the, and the goal of that is to test as many candidates as possible in an efficient way on a global adaptive trial platform um, that would have a global governance mechanism and enable vaccines from you know, around the world, from big or small companies to come, come and get tested. Uh, and and uh, I mentioned that it's important that the efficacy and safety of vaccines be established before they are licensed for use, because if you end up in a, in a situation where a lot of countries start doing emergency use uh, uh, approvals, you will end up with the situation vaccines being given to people without cl clinical trials then being possible and without the data that would be needed in the future to, to uh, make sure that we're using the most optimal vaccines. Because considering we have you know, 170 or 200 almost in development, there is no reason why we should not be able to use the best, uh, the most promising vaccines, both in terms of efficacy and safety, and also in terms of understanding which vaccine works better in which subpopulation, older people, pregnant women, children, etc. So there's a lot of work to be done. Everyone is, of course, in a rush to get the vaccines into people as soon as possible. But if you end up with a vaccine with poor efficacy of 20, 30 percent, even if you pop vaccinate people, it's not going to have the impact that you desire and the, and the pandemic is not going to subside. So meanwhile, we need to have what is often called the social vaccine, which is all of these measures we've talked about, the public health measures will need to continue for a significant period, at least for the next year to year and a half before vaccination coverage uh, gets to the point where you start building population uh, uh, immunity. So maybe I will stop there, uh, Suresh, and uh, then we can see later on based on the questions that you get. Yeah. Uh, Samia, wonderful. Thank you for this. Uh, WHO is facing a monumental task with 200 countries trying to coordinate all these activities. And this is actually a wonderful transition to our uh, final panelist, uh, who is uh, Dr. Vikram Paratkar, from, who is Senior Vice President for Technical Operations at 
Biological E, uh, which is based in Hyderabad. In his role, Dr. Paratkar helps, uh, heads all of the activities uh, related to commercial and clinical manufacturing of vaccines, uh, as well as new product development. He's been uh, leading technical operations at BioE for uh, about seven years now. Uh, he obtained his uh, PhD in biochemical engineering at the University of Iowa in the United States and has worked with a variety of biotech based companies for approximately 20 years before joining BioE. So just to give you an example, he's worked with Monsanto, Bio Biological Products, Wyeth uh, Biopharma, now Pfizer, and uh, finally Reliance uh, Life Sciences before he joined uh, BioE. And he's had a lot of experience in process development, product development, technical operations, as well as commercial and clinical manufacturing of biotherapeutical products. And BioE, as uh, you'll hear, has been very much engaged in the vaccine effort. So he's going to enlighten us about vaccine efforts in India, the path forward and challenges. So Vikram, I want to transition over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Suresh. Um, you know, uh, when uh, uh, China published the sequence of the novel coronavirus, and after a few days, uh, there was a start of uh, uh, instance of human to human transmission. Suddenly, it uh, dawned on everybody that this could be the uh, very large major pandemic that we would be facing because it had all the properties of uh, transmissibility of a normal uh, flu uh, uh, coronaviruses that we are all familiar with. And uh, it seemed to be much more uh, virulent than. Uh, the traditional flu viruses. And uh, everybody immediately realized that the only way to tackle this would be to develop a uh, proper vaccine against it. And uh, with that uh, uh, you know, background, everybody started thinking about uh, uh, developing vaccines. Uh, in vaccines, uh, uh, unlike some of the small molecules we have seen where you suddenly come across uh, interesting uh, uh, compounds, interesting uh, metabolites and so on, that have uh, biological properties and they give you some kind of uh, uh, therapeutic option. With vaccines, you have to literally start from scratch and build the, uh, the candidate. Uh, you have to assemble the whole thing. And there are various ways of doing it. Uh, and we have learned a lot over many, many decades now how to develop a successful vaccine against the type of pathogen. Now, this pathogen was so new uh, so and was so urgent. Uh, all the companies literally started working on various types of strategies that have proven to be reasonably successful from the past experience. And each strategy, you have to start with a, a concept and then you assemble the right candidate from it. And, and because uh, you know, last uh, 20 years or so, uh, we have seen uh, significant new type of vaccines uh, introduced into our uh, uh, repertoire. All of these technologies have come to the forefront now uh, to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the types of vaccines that are under development, there are vaccines which are the, the ones that we keep on hearing the most about, uh, adenoviral vector, which are uh, non-replicating uh, viruses, adenoviruses. They don't cause the, uh, any infections in people, but they can deliver a, a small part of the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, spike protein, uh, along with them into uh, our body and start priming the body for infection. So those are, uh, I would say, very new class of virus, uh, sorry, new class of uh, vaccines. Uh, only one vaccine which was uh, approved for Ebola actually was based on a similar concept. So this is, uh, if this vaccine becomes uh, successful, this will be one of the largest uh, deployment of that technology uh, for, uh, uh, as a vaccine. Then the, the two types of vaccines that are that could be developed very quickly, the mRNA-based vaccines, as well as uh, uh, the DNA-based vaccines, because uh, these vaccines, uh, you know, only need uh, the genetic information, and then you can quickly uh, formulate them, and you know, you can get into evaluation mode. But these are not proven vaccines yet; they have not been uh, uh, used uh, as a human therapeutics uh, therapeutic vaccines. Uh, in, you know, uh, in history. So uh, this is going to be a, a very quick technology, but hasn't been proven yet. So we'll see uh, how it uh, pans out for this uh, specific uh, uh, 
pandemic. Then there are some very uh, traditional uh, proven technologies such as uh, developing um, uh, what is called as inactivated virus. This is being a virus. Uh, most a lot of viruses you can actually take the virus as it is and just inactivate it by gentle methods so that the structure remains uh, still very much the same but it has no infectivity and those virus uh, infect sorry those inactivated viruses can act as a good uh, uh, vaccine so we see uh, the covaxin uh, trial that has started in india as well as the cancino biologicals uh, uh, vaccine that was uh, approved for emergency use in china so those are you know that type of uh, classical uh, cl class of vaccine then you have a, a what is called as a protein subunit vaccine where you take a piece of the virus and then you express that protein in a recombinant manner uh, and then use that protein and then use it as an antigen so one of the most successful uh, vaccine of this nature is uh, obviously hepatitis b vaccine so hepatitis b vaccine uh, which uh, helped uh, uh, check the spread of hepatitis B is based on this concept. Uh, some of the flu virus vaccines uh, are based on the same concept where you take uh, parts of the flu virus called agglutinins uh, on the surface of the flu virus and you uh, isolate those proteins, produce those proteins and then you use them as antigen. Then there is a, another class which is probably the uh, probably the most difficult uh, to uh, develop which is called as attenuated vaccine. So viruses uh, uh, are very virulent but you can reduce their virulence by making some changes to their genetic sequence and these uh, viruses which are called as attenuated viruses can be used as a very good vaccine measles for example rubella mumps varicella all of these virus uh, viruses uh, can be converted into an attenuated form uh, by making some proper changes to them either through uh, uh, just a brute force like a passaging or through some genetic modification which are now becoming much more prevalent so those vaccines however take a long time because you have to demonstrate that once attenuated the virus cannot go back to its virulent uh, form because if it does that then you could have a, a fairly uh, complex situation on your hands <laughs> uh, and so uh, these vaccines takes a longer time to uh, you know demonstrate in multiple animal species to show that they cannot go back to the virulent form then there are some novel new uh, technologies coming up such as nanoparticle based vaccines where these antigens are studded onto a nanoparticle so it just uh, makes it much more immunogenic uh, so this this type of uh, plus you have a slightly different delivery like aerosol delivery nasal intranasal delivery and so on so i think the interesting thing is many companies have developed expertise and a lot of companies are now developing vaccines based on their expertise because in vaccine you need to understand your product so well because if you don't understand it it's very difficult to develop it and uh, make it available to other people and what you have been doing for many years you understand that typically very well you understand how to make it how to make it consistent how to make it safe how to make it efficacious and once you develop that knowledge over a period of time you can take on the additional tasks of newer vaccines and so companies that are uh, that have been developing vaccines many years they have developed this expertise, they have de developed this infrastructure, the, the critical mass of people in all expertise. You need people in manufacturing, you need people in basic research, people who can do clinical trials, people who can assess uh, in various animal models. So all these people you require from different backgrounds. The companies have assembled these teams. And so now they are using where they feel that they have the best expertise. They are now advancing those type of candidates. So uh, each company is, you know, handling this. Another thing we have seen uh, is companies are forming a lot of partnerships. Uh, very rarely you see in vaccines so many partnerships are offering. Even large companies are forming partnerships among themselves. So um, we have partnerships for basic research, partnerships where the companies are sharing candidates, partnerships where sh companies are sharing uh, clinical uh, development, uh, and so on and so forth. And then lastly, there are manufacturing partnerships. And uh, India is actually a very important uh, uh, country in terms of the manufacturing partnerships. So India has established itself as uh, uh, a very important supplier of vaccines to the world. Almost 60% of the vaccines that are used in routine immunization globally, especially in the lower middle income countries, come from India. And I think 
you know, uh, it may not be a hyperbole, but a lot of the countries of the world are looking towards India to supply a COVID-19 vaccine in the right quantity, in the right uh, dosage, and the right price. And so, uh, India, Indian companies are participating in these very complex uh, manufacturing partnerships. My company, BioE, we already have, uh, uh, you know, signed a partnership with Johnson & Johnson for one of the adenoviral vaccines. Uh, Serum Institute has done a similar uh, uh, partnership with Oxford and AstraZeneca. Other companies are also stepping up to the plate. So not only are we developing our own candidates, we are also uh, forming partnerships with many uh, other uh, manufacturers who currently do not have the capacity to provide these vaccines at a very large scale at a highly affordable prices. Uh, just to give an example, in India, we can produce a vaccine and deliver at a price less than a bottle of water. And, you know, for, for fighting a pandemic of the size and scale of COVID-19, you require that uh, uh, type of uh, capacity, that type of uh, scale, and that type of a commitment. Uh, to make it available globally, because this is pandemic is absolutely goal over. It's not only affecting one small area. Uh, the last part from a manufacturer's perspective is, uh, you know, COVAX facility that uh, Dr. Swaminathan mentioned uh, is going to be very key because uh, vaccines is a very uh, uh, long, uh, long range business, long cycle times for product development and so on. And it involves a lot of capacity um, that we have to deploy. Uh, across the company and if you do that we require some surety of uh, demand uh, some uh, pull in the demand and so having a facility like a COVAX gives manufacturers a, a, a window or uh, at least an exposure to what uh, market could be available there and based on that we can tailor our capacity we can tailor our efforts so this is going to be very important uh, uh, so as we deploy our formidable uh, infrastructure and uh, we hope to produce the vaccines for the world as well as for our uh, countrymen uh, uh, you know it's a it's a very challenging time i think we will uh, live up to the challenge thank you thank you so much uh, vikram so uh, this really brings up a whole series of questions i'm going to start with something that all of you have touched on and samia i'm going to direct this to you and this is this uh, um, idea that touches upon vaccine uh, and uh, nationalism and how uh, ethical we are in distributing the vaccine to the world and so on. So you have every country is trying to protect their own citizens. Uh, and uh, so there's first priority naturally might uh, be considered to give it to those people. We are also not likely to produce 2 billion vaccines in a very short time. So there's also the debate going on actively as to who should be the first in line uh, to get the vaccine. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, this concept of uh, uh, vaccine uh, nationalism? Because I want uh, to, you to bring out the ethical parts of it, the policy parts of it, and then the real challenge of finally getting to a decision on, on this whole thing. Thank you, uh, Suresh. Um, past experience of, uh, let's say, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic was that vaccines and drugs actually um, the a, a bulk of the global supply was actually reserved by a few high income countries by making these advance payments. And it was only later that some of that supply was made available to lower income countries. Luckily, H1N1 didn't turn out to be the pandemic that uh, it could have. And so it didn't have the impact. However, uh, there is a serious um, possibility that you know this could be repeated. So that's exactly why the COVAX facility has been created to serve both the high income and the low income countries and provide a solution for the whole world. Because this is not a typical disease which affects a few countries or it affects only low income countries where the high income countries then become the donors and they provide the vaccines for free. This is a situation where all countries and populations need vaccine in order to protect themselves and to for the global economy to get back on track. Now, as you rightly said, in the beginning, we're going to have limited doses of the vaccine. It's, it's going to be in initially probably tens of millions then hundreds of millions of doses. Eventually, and hopefully, if many of these vaccines turn out to be 
uh, effective and safe than billions of doses. But in the first year, let's say 2021, you're going to have batches of a few hundred million doses. And how do you actually fairly distribute that um, across the world? So the WHO has developed something called the Fair Allocation Framework and Mechanism, which has been discussed by the member states, by countries. They've given a lot of feedback. The goal is uh, initially to try to reduce the acute impact of this pandemic, reduce the mortality, reduce the impact on the health system by vaccinating frontline workers, healthcare workers, and other social workers, elderly and others identified within countries as being most vulnerable. So every country might have a slightly different population it considers vulnerable. But that the available doses through the COVAX would be given in tranches to countries. So starting with enough to cover 3% of the population. So everybody would get enough to cover 3% of their population, which could cover some of these high-risk groups. Then with increasing vaccine, you would go to cover about 20% of the population, which would take care of most of the vulnerable groups. And uh, the idea is that no country goes racing ahead to cover you know, 70% of their population while others are waiting with nothing, where everybody agrees to share the available doses equitably. So that's the concept that it has a lot of support. It has uh, a fair amount of commitment. But um, again, there are countries which are also making bilateral deals. And this word vaccine nationalism has been used. Uh, what we are saying is it doesn't prevent those countries from also participating in the COVAX facility. Um, and so we've made it possible and flexible for countries to do both, protect their own populations and at the same time ensure that the rest of the world also gets vaccines. Yeah. So like the next few that, weeks, will, uh, yeah. this will play out, I'm sure. So I'd like uh, to invite uh, Gagandeep and Vikram also to uh, uh, you know, address this particular question. So Gagandeep, yeah, who, how is the decision being made in India as to you know, who should get the vaccine first? Uh, and uh, related to this, uh, you know, I'd like to come to answer the question about uh, who pays for all of this, the clinical trials uh, uh, in, in, in the Indian context, you know, the, the, the testing clinical trials and all, all the things that need to take the vaccine. You talked about the push-pull uh, uh, strategy and, you know, you have, uh, companies like Serum Institute and so on have put out hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investment to create vaccines well before we know whether these vaccines work. In the end, someone has to foot the bill. Uh, and so you talked a little bit about the mechanism where promises made to deliver those vaccines to, let's say, a, a, a COVAX facility or something like that gives them some uh, uh, idea that the products will be sold. But... Uh, so let's go to Gagandhi first on, on uh, who gets the vaccine and then, then come to funding issues. There is a new committee that has been established under Dr. Vinod Paul, member Niti Aayog, that is looking into allocation in India. And we will hear from that committee, which has just begun its meetings. Uh, there are um, Obviously, WHO has been doing this now for several months and is further along in terms of categorizing vulnerable groups who should be prioritized, thinking through the percentages of the population that are likely to be required uh, around the world. But every country needs to make some decisions for itself. And in India, given that our population structure is a bit different from other parts of the world, it's important that we get this right. So Dr. Paul's committee will be looking into all of this. In terms of payment, it's been announced that the government will be providing vaccine to people who will be using it. So it doesn't look like the standard approach, which is what usually happens in India, that there is both a public and a private market will play a role here. 
but we'll need to wait and see what the various committees say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Vikram, you have anything to add to this? Uh, actually, uh, uh, we participated in one of the meetings with uh, uh, Dr. Paul that uh, uh, Dr. Kang mentioned. So they are definitely looking into how, you know, how would the vaccine manufacturers start supplying the vaccines? How much can they supply? And so they are definitely looking into ways to uh, you know, figure out the distribution of these vaccines. Uh, you mentioned about the funding. So you are right. Uh, uh, developing a vaccine is a fairly uh, uh, capital intensive as well as resource intensive uh, task, which is, uh, you know, uh, as expected. Uh, we are receiving uh, some specific funding from Government of India for doing clinical trials. Uh, we are also receiving funding from uh, uh, organizations like uh, outside India, like foundations and so on. CEPI that uh, uh, Dr. Swaminathan mentioned uh, is uh, also in the fray right now in terms of funding uh, specific parts of uh, manufacturing technologies, manufacturing capacities and so on. So there are these... Uh, 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 rapid funding uh, sources are becoming available, uh, which is helping the manufacturers. Uh, and, you know, uh, we are also deploying our own resources, which we are already developed for our traditional vaccine businesses. And we are just, you know, using same resources for uh, developing a COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, uh, that's why you see a lot of vaccine companies are developing vaccines for this because they already have a lot of infrastructure, uh, both from uh, manpower, from uh, technologies from uh, you know, infrastructure perspective. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a. Uh, I think we, everybody, you know, we are learning a new things here. Uh, some of these uh, funding mechanisms didn't exist uh, several years ago, but they have yes. come to the fore now. So yeah. So I want to weave next uh, three things that you mentioned. You know, on the one hand, uh, uh, I was really struck by the fact that uh, Gagandeep, you talked about. Uh, zero positivity in Mumbai and Pune in the range of 50%. Uh, so and the one, I know that there have been articles in the media saying in some areas we are almost reaching herd immunity. And then the, the challenge on the other side is that the vaccine when it's developed is going to be given initially if they follow the WHO guidelines to 3% of the people. Um, and uh, Gagandeep, you also pointed out that this uh, in, we don't know that the people who have uh, antibodies have it as neutralizing antibodies, whether it's effective against this virus and so on. So the, uh, talk to us a little bit about the seropositivity. And you also pointed out that that's a challenge because as you try to enroll uh, people for clinical trials, the fact that they already have antibodies doesn't allow you to do this test. So it seems like a lot of challenges around this particular point. Yeah. So it's there are very few places in the country that are doing the traditional neutralization test. And we've been lucky that at THSDI, we were able to establish that early and use it. So it looks like people who have high levels of binding antibodies also have neutralizing antibodies. But what is very interesting is that THSTI has been following up under the leadership of Shinjini Bhatnagar, a cohort of people who are RT-PCR positive. And over 10% of them don't seem to make binding antibodies. These are, of course, mostly people who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. It does seem to hold out that if you have more severe disease, you make more binding antibodies and higher levels of binding antibodies correlate with neutralizing antibodies. So what this means in terms of zero surveys requires us to look at the zero survey data more carefully to look at who has low levels and who has high levels, what was the antigen that was used and then to get some of those samples and evaluate them for neutralizing antibodies. Now there is a commercial surrogate neutralization test that is available. It's expensive and in short supply, but at least it allows you to do the testing outside of a BSL-3 facility. So hopefully we will be generating more data soon. 
do Vikram or Samia have anything to add to this? Okay, so antigen is very important. Which antigen is used yeah, to detect? Right. Uh, yes. So uh, the zero surveillance data is very misleading because uh, we do not know what the quality of the antibody is, what is the threshold of uh, declaration of zero positive is, and so on. So it's very difficult to assess a zero positive versus a protected person and, and so on and so forth. And yes, so, 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 so I'd like you to just comment on something that your director has pointed out very uh, cogently, and that is uh, in the media, you, you see these pockets of things about oh, herd immunity is just around the corner. So I want you to uh, just uh, uh, give your opinion on, on that because it seems like that's a challenge that's going to take quite some time to get to. Yeah, I think it's, I wanted to add to what uh, Gagandeep and Vikram were saying that people shouldn't get the impression that 60% of uh, Pune or Mumbai uh, population is protected and that they now just go about normal life because they're not going to get it because there are many questions still that need to be answered, including, you know, what do these positive zero antibody tests mean, depending on what test was done, et cetera. And also the sampling has been done mainly in those areas which were highly impacted. And so if you look at India as a whole, you probably have a large part of the country where the exposure has been very, very limited. And so the vast majority of our population is still susceptible to this virus. And, and the virus isn't just gonna stay in little pockets, it's going to move and you can see already the virus is moving now into the smaller towns and uh, eventually into villages. So uh, the concept of herd immunity or population immunity should be only thought of in the context of a vaccine. It's going to be practically impossible to get yes. there through natural infection because it's going to have to take a long time. It's going to have a big impact on people's lives and on health systems. And um, it's not a very practical solution uh, because of the reasons that just because one small slum in Pune or Mumbai achieved 50 or 60%, first of all, we don't know if that means protection and for how long we're still learning from reinfection now. I think uh, uh, every day now we're getting a new case of reinfection being reported. So over the next days, we will learn more about reinfection, how long uh, protective immunity lasts, what it means, uh, what, what does second infection look like, etc. So till we understand more about protective immunity, I think we have to be very cautious in, uh, in uh, proposing that uh, we should just go for herd immunity. It's, it's going to happen naturally, of course, but uh, we cannot take our uh, foot off the, the brake in terms of putting in those measures that will slow down uh, transmission and eventually wait for the vaccine. I want to go to, uh, uh, so there are now reports, uh, at least in the US and Hong Kong uh, and so on, of a few cases uh, where green infections have been documented fairly carefully. So uh, Gagandeep, is there any data in India at this point on uh, reinfections? There is some emerging data that is being investigated. So we want, there are people in Mumbai as well as other cities that have identified people who have tested RT-PCR positive twice. And we'd like to be sure that we have sequence data from the two infections to be able to confirm that they really are reinfections. So nothing published yet, but something in the works. Yeah, I want to turn next to this thing that's been uh, bandied about in the media. Uh, it's called twindemics. And the, the, basically the term refers to the fact that while the world's resources are being diverted towards COVID-19 and trying to deal with this pandemic, uh, other diseases, uh, whether uh, this happens in combination with influenza or dengue or malaria, uh, is really posing a multiple risk uh, in that uh, those are already problems that countries like India are facing uh, before COVID-19 landed in their laps. So uh, I'd like to hear from all three of you have been involved in uh, uh, vaccines and, and, and therapies for uh, many of these uh, diseases. So, Samia, could we start with you on, you know, the WHO uh, has been making announcements not to drop 
those other diseases uh, and pay attention to them. And uh, Gagandeep, you're facing this having uh, uh, dealt with it in India. Uh, I'd like to hear from both of you and Vikram, of course. So maybe we could start with Samia on this. We, uh, WHO did a survey actually of essential health services and mm -hmm. about, uh, I think it was something like 120 countries responded or at least 100 countries responded. And there are large, most of them actually came back saying that essential health services had been disrupted uh, to different extents. So the most commonly impacted was immunization programs because of the state of the outreach. So routine immunization program, maternal and antenatal health services, contraceptive services, uh, essential surgery, non-communicable disease, uh, dental, you know, and a whole host of, uh, of others. Um, and so, including tuberculosis, uh, case detection and case uh, treatment, we know in India, in fact, there's been a 26% drop in case notification in this year compared to the last year during the same period. This is because of a number of reasons. Health workers have been diverted to COVID-19 health. Many health facilities were closed temporarily. Uh, and people couldn't get to health centers because of a lack of transportation and fear of going to hospitals because they might catch uh, COVID. So for all of these reasons, there's been a disruption and I've seen uh, very worrying reports from some states indicating that maternal and infant mortality rates are already rising. So I think this is really uh, a, a very urgent and important issue health systems need to put in place uh, plans to do both, to run their regular health services. Of course, you can make use of digital technologies, telemedicine, etc., but that needs to be part of the package or a strategy that's developed as to how you're going to maintain your regular health uh, services and also do COVID. And this is the challenge because obviously then the health workforce would need to be supplemented existing staff who were mobilized for COVID need to go back to their regular activities, which means then you need additional staff employed to do things like the contact tracing, the follow-up of patients, making sure that they get linked, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there needs to be urgent investment, I think, in uh, the health workforce, as well as a well-thought-out plan, state by state, district by district, on how for the next foreseeable future, at least for the next one year, there needs to be a plan in place as to how we balance both of these. Mm -hmm. uh, Gagandeep, uh, do you want to say something about this uh, in India? I think we need to align with what's happening in other parts of the world as well. So I don't think that we should be doing anything that's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to be respectful of, of, of people's time. Let, so let me just ask uh, uh, maybe one or two more questions and try to wrap this up in five minutes. So uh, Gagandeep, I, I want to go back to you. You, you know, I was struck by the numbers that you, we both pointed out that uh, as of today, India has the highest uh, caseloads of any country in the world, uh, uh, 75,000 or so, and yet the mortality, mortality in terms of uh, people dying per million population. You know, India is somewhere around 47 uh, or so, and uh, uh, the, the top two countries, USA and Brazil, are about 560 or so. Uh, is there a, a reason for this? So, so how can we keep both the caseload and mortality low uh, in India? Do you have uh, suggestions for that? There are actually three reasons that we can identify straight away for potential lower mortality rates and then a lot of unknowns. So what is known uh, is one, when a pandemic is going on, you're not going to have accurate reporting of deaths. That happens. And ultimately, you're going to get a sense of what mortality is like once you have, in addition to the information that we are getting now on deaths that are assigned to COVID, 
also excess all-cause mortality, taking into account that certain causes of death will decrease during periods where people don't travel as much. So having accurate information on deaths does not happen certainly in India in real time, and we will understand more as we go along. The second part of this is that our population structures are different. We have a much smaller proportion of people over 60 or 65 years of age, and we know that these are the highest risk groups. So one way of thinking about it is if you are 80 years old in India, it's likely that you belong to a higher socioeconomic class. So even among the people that we have that are elderly, we are likely to see less traditional risk factors like obesity, comorbidities, et cetera, because these are people who are older for being able, older because they've survived in India. And the third part of it is uh, we had a lockdown early on and that delayed the climb that we are seeing now. And if you look at what's happened around the world, a lot of clinical management has changed. So I think survival rates now are higher than they were initially. There is a lot about the management of severe disease that we did not know in the early days. For example, proning patients, keeping patients off ventilators. The early days from China, all you heard about was ventilation, ECMO, in order to get patients to survive. We know that keeping patients off ventilators is what the best thing we can do at the moment. So these three things we know for sure. Is this a complete explanation? Probably not. How much it accounts for? I think probably a significant proportion of why we are seeing or reporting fewer deaths in India. Thank you. So, Samia, I want to come to you for the last question uh, of the day. I wish we had uh, uh, more time and we, we could tap into your wisdom. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been fascinated by the fact that WHO has been preparing itself for many, many years now, almost a decade for such a pandemic. And here, this, and you've been scrambling since the beginning of the year to deal with it, probably with very little sleep. So are there lessons learned in all of this that uh, you'd like the audience to know about? Yeah, clearly, I think the biggest lesson learned is that no country in the world was prepared for a pandemic, regardless of high, middle, or low income. And um, even countries with very good health systems in terms of clinical management, when it came to the public health response, you know, there were gaps uh, and challenges. So this is why the WHO has now set up the independent pandemic preparedness response panel, independent panel looking at pandemic uh, preparedness, which is uh, co-chaired by um, Helen Clark and uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, uh, two, you know, very well-known heads of state they will then select the other members of the panel and they will also look into what um, their work is going to be. But it's going to be around looking at the pandemic preparedness and response, both WHO and also member states. Um, investments in preparedness are often neglected because investments in preparedness are invisible. They don't attract a lot of attention. They don't, uh, they're not, you know, they don't pay dividend immediately. And if they are effective and preventing outbreaks and pandemics, then you know, nobody ever sees that it's there. And so it's much easier for investments in, uh, in a hospital or in something very visible uh, for governments to make. So this is, you, know, you have to invest in a lot of different things, starting from surveillance, from building data systems, to lab strengthening, to having 
you know, epidemic uh, epidemiologists at the district level who can do outbreak investigations, uh, having a response plan, and also research. I should say that research should be part of uh, preparedness activities, as you know, I had mentioned earlier. We had done so. All of these, you know, are, are lacking. But this is the time now to really do that. So, it, uh, especially for countries like India, which have, are investing in universal health coverage through Ayushman Bharat, have committed to increasing expenditure on on health. There's a national health plan in 2017 that talks about building a public health cadre in every state. This is the time actually to do some of that. Um, and, and maybe there are a few examples around the world which we can take from and learn, but I think it's all there in the plan. This is really, because this is not going to be the last epidemic or pandemic okay. that we see, and, and therefore we cannot afford to repeat the same mistakes again. Okay. Well, uh, like all good things, this too must come to an end. I want to thank uh, first the audience for uh, uh, being there and to our brilliant guest speakers for making it a really exciting and informative uh, 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 program. Uh, to the audience uh, again and, and our speakers, uh, thanks again for being here. Stay safe and good day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.